Welcome to the Bowers Museum. I'm Wade Davis, writer, photographer, filmmaker, and guest curator of the exhibit, Everest, Ascent to Glory. Today, I will be guiding you through a virtual highlights tour of this exciting exhibit. Of course, this will just provide a glimpse into the wonder of these images that tell us so much about those early efforts by the British to reach the summit of the world. And we hope that you'll join us on site soon to fully experience yourself the wonder of this collection before it closes on August 28th. And while you're here, you'll also discover eight other permanent collection galleries and our current featured exhibits which are created in partnership with world-class institutions from around the globe. So visit Bowers.org for tickets and more information to start planning your trip today. The British and Empire of Explorers had famously lost the race to the North and South Pole, and so Everest kind of emerged as a third pole within the realm of the British Raj, looming over the nation of Nepal from Tibet. The challenge, as the British set out to climb the mountain, was simply to find it. No European in 1921 had approached the mountain at close quarters. And so the initial expedition in 21 was a reconnaissance. They had to move from Darjeeling up the Chumbi Valley between Bhutan and Nepal. Now remember, Nepal was completely closed to outsiders at that time. The only way to go was through Tibet. But that meant coming up the Chumbi Valley and then turning west, walking 320 miles off the map simply to reach a mountain that was the highest summit in the world. That was the big challenge in 1921, simply to find the mountain, to find the chink in the armor of the mountains, to find the route that could be taken that might allow them to reach the top of the world. If Everest began as a mission of redemption for an empire of explorers who had lost the race to the poles, in the wake of World War I, it became a mission of regeneration for a nation and a generation bled white by the conflict. Of the 26 men who went to Everest in 1921, 22, and 24, 20 had seen the worst of the fighting. Jack Hazard, who went to the top of the North Pole in 1924, did so with open wounds from the Battle of the Somme, still saturating the canvas of his climbing tunic. After World War I, as the legendary Himalayan explorer Tom Longstaff said, laconically, the supply of climbers wasn't quite what it was before the war. Many had been brutalized, many had been killed. So who did go? Well, when you look at this photograph of these men, George Mallory, Sandy Wollaston, Guy Bullock, the, ben the governor of Bengal, Howard Burry, and the irascible Scott um, Rayburn, Harold Rayburn, you wouldn't exactly think these men are ready to take on the biggest mountaineering challenge in the world, but appearances can be deceiving. Sandy Wollaston once went on an expedition to Uganda, to the mountains of the moon, and at the end of nine months in the jungle, he thought, why go back to England the same way? And he walked from the source of the Congo to the mouth, becoming the second person to do it since Stanley. Howard Burry, stripped off his clothes naked and anointed his body with holy oils and walked the length of the Ganges River. He famously killed a man-eating tiger that had killed and eaten 21 holy men. So these were extraordinary men who lived in an era that we can hardly imagine, and these were the men who took on Everest in 1921. Well, the British didn't just climb Everest on their own. They did so, of course, in collaboration with porters and high-altitude tigers, as they called them, the Sherpa, who became the legends of Everest, as they are to this day. And this was highly significant because Everest was never divorced from the culture of the Raj. And so in 1953, when Tenzing Norgay reached the summit of Everest with Ed Hillary, and critically when neither man said who got there first, that inverted colonial history itself. After that, there would never again be a moment when the British could dare look down upon 
the Nepalese or indeed the Tibetans as if they were somehow not equal to themselves. And so that act transformed the notion of what it meant to be colonized, what it meant to be a colonial. And in fact, this was a moment when, as Nehru said, the Indian people would never again walk with heads bowed to an outside colonial force. In 1921, going for the summit of Everest was almost like going to the surface of the moon. There were so many questions. Would we be able to breathe at such heights? It was known from pilots in World War I that without oxygen at such heights, they could readily pass out. And even if supplemental oxygen was brought to the expedition, was it sporting? And what happened if the apparatus broke down at such heights? Would someone be able to survive? Nothing of this was certain or known. People back in London who had never climbed anything higher than their desks thought that oxygen was unsporting. Of the climbers, particularly those more medically or scientifically inclined, like George Finch or Howard Somerville, they viewed oxygen as no more of a supplement than a good pair of boots. It wouldn't get you up the mountain, but it might be allow you to survive the mountain. And so oxygen became the big question in 1922, and it was when George Finch set the height record in that year that it became a no-brainer. It was understood that oxygen would be essential. The 1921 expedition was in fact a reconnaissance. They had to find the mountain and then they had to find what they called the chink in the armor of the mountain, a way to get to the top. It's important to remember that the climbers of this era were ridge walkers. They had to find a way up to what they called a coal, which is just a saddle that would lead to a ridge that would lead to a ridge that would lead to the summit. For example, George Mallory in 1921 scoped the western coombe and the Lhotse face that Hillary would climb with Tenzing in 1953. He thought it was impossible. Why? Because front-pointed crampons had not been invented. There was no way you could cut steps 4,000 feet in ice at those elevations. Crampons would only come along about 1928, and the really good ones not until after World War II. So in 1921, Mallory identified from the West Rongbuk Glacier Hillary's route of, 20, of 53 and rejected it. He then saw beneath the north face of Everest a coal that he thought would lead to the Northeast Ridge. It couldn't be climbed from that side of the mountain. So the whole expedition's purpose from then on was to find a way to get to the other side, to what he called the coal of our desires. And it took the expedition till its very end to get up the Carta Glacier and from the summit of the Lakbala, what they called Windy Gap, where they made their highest camp, they looked down over this East Rongbuk Glacier to the key to the mountain. This was the opening to the mountain, the only opening that existed in 1921. They called it the North Coal. And they made their camp here, and in the final thrust, Guy Bullock, George Mallory, and Oliver Wheeler climbed this to 23,000 feet, reaching higher than any human beings had ever been. And when they crested the coal, a wind hit them like nothing they had ever known. They said the only way they survived was to recall how they survived bombardments in the battlefields of France in the First World War, slowing down the mind, breathing between the gusts of the wind, the blasts of the shell fire. And that was the moment when they knew that Everest could be climbed. In 1924, George Mallory, aged 38, the most famous mountaineer in the world, together with his young protege, Sandy Irvin, a lad just out of Cambridge, set out for the summit of Everest. They left their camp early. They were sighted by Noah O'Dell, cresting the Northeast Ridge, going strong for the top when the mist rolled in and enveloped 
their memory in myth. And the question that's haunted mountaineers since that time is this question. Did Mallory get to the top before he met his end? Did he leave Irvin at the base of the second step, the only major impediment on that ridge, to make a solo effort to the summit? Well, of course, Mallory would never leave a young man behind. And when his body was found by Conrad Anker in 1999, sure enough, George Mallory still had around him his waist the rope, this rope, that had connected him to his young friend, Sandy Irvin, whose body has never been found. You know, it's often said that the climbers of 1921 and 22 and 24 were these sort of Englishmen dressed in tweeds who read Shakespeare to each other at 23,000 feet in the snow. And that certainly was the image that captured my imagination. Well, the truth of the matter is they were pretty well equipped. They had good woolen clothes. They knew how to layer. Uh, they had, you know, pretty strong supplies. They had good reasonably good tents, they had electric torches, they had uh, um, uh, sleeping bags, etc. But they were lacking a few critical components. Their ropes weren't nearly as strong as the nylon ropes that were available in 1953. Critically, their boots were leather, often cobbled uh, with nails that only drew the cold into the feet, as opposed to the modern boots that even by 1953 had made great advances. But the critical thing, crampons. These spiky little additions to the sole of your boot that allow you to walk on ice. The Kumbu ice field could not have been traversed without crampons. And critically, the Lotse face, which rises from the Valley of Silence, as the Swiss called the Western Kumbu, to the South Coal of Everest, that could never have been climbed without front-pointed crampons, which were only invented after the British expeditions of the 1920s. So these limitations were not that many, but they were highly significant. Well, this, of course, is a famous photograph taken by Ed Hillary of Tenzin Norgay on that day when they reached the top of the world. Critically, Hillary declined Tenzing's offer to take a snap of himself. His mind was on the moment. He turned his camera around him to photograph the landscape, but also the route down the Northeast Ridge where Mallory's body lay. And as Hillary came off the mountain, he said to George Lowe, well, we knocked the bastard off. And then his next words were to another companion, wouldn't George Mallory have been amazed? And Tenzing, meanwhile, had transformed the very image of India itself and of Nepal. Forever, the British anticipated that lads from Cambridge or Oxford would be the first to reach the summit of the world. And when it was reached by a humble beekeeper from the far reaches of empire, Ed Hillary, and a humble Sherpa who'd been raised in a yak herder's tent, everything inverted. This was a gesture that transformed what it meant to be colonized and to be a colonial. This, after all, is only six years after India's independence. Nehru seized upon this in a dramatic way. These men came off the summit world into a blaze of international celebrity. Hillary was knighted even before he reached the monastery of Timbuche on the trek out of the Everest Massif. Tenzing in India was seen as an incarnation of Shiva. And in fact, the king of Nepal announced formally that the two greatest products of his kingdom in all of history had been the Buddha and Tenzing Norgay. This was a moment that transformed the world. We hope that you enjoyed our virtual highlights tour of Everest, Ascent to Glory. If you enjoyed this exhibit, please consider taking a deeper dive into the subject by visiting the Bowers Museum in person before Everest closes August 28th, or participating in one of the many programs held in conjunction with the exhibit. All these events can be found on the Bowers Museum online events calendar at bowers.org. Thank you, as always, for your support.